On this week's Marketing Mavericks, we talked to Evan Green, who's the head of marketing for the Recording Academy, and Brian Rich of Little M Media, all about the evolution of music in social media. We connect fans to artists. How are we doing it? And how should we focus on our personal music brand? Coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Marketing Mavericks is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. Welcome to Marketing Mavericks, the intersection of marketing and technology, where we talk about everything that's happening in the space of what brands are doing, what agencies are doing, the apps that we like, the software that we use, and much more. How is the internet changing the way that we talk to customers? Well, today, we're talking all about music. That's right. We've got Evan Green, who's the Chief Marketing Officer for the Recording Academy, the Grammys joining us, and Brian Rich who is the Managing Director for Little M Media, joining us as well. Um, welcome, Evan and Brian, to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank so, you. Yeah, well, so, um, Evan, you're, you're, in, uh, well, you're in L.A., right, Los Angeles? I am. I'm at the Recording Academy right now, at the um, corporate office, and uh, you're in New York, Brian, who's already, who's already put the disclaimer that... Um, that you'd have better internet connection on a cruise ship, right, Brian? Yeah, no, there was an article earlier in the week that the speed of the internet connections on the luxury cruise lines that uh, run all over the seas and oceans is faster than the uh, high-speed internet available in midtown Manhattan, which is where I am. So uh, <laughs> next show uh, from, uh, you know, international waters. I think and that's given, a- and given my And given my challenge connecting with Skype this morning, I am in internet jail. So... Uh, <laughs> That's why you can't see me. So we're having lots of uh, connectivity problems. But you know what? We will overcome these challenges because we have some great stuff to talk about. Um, And one of my favorite events and certainly a leading event is uh, your big event, Evan. So you actually work for the Recording Academy, which is a nonprofit. um, And your big event that's one day out of the whole year, although it takes much more time to plan for that event, is the Grammys, your big music event. How much of your time is actually spent on the Grammys versus other Recording Academy efforts, Evan? Well, what's funny is, is most people think one of two things when they find out um, what my job is, and they, they either think I have 11 months off, or they think I spend 364 of the other days of the year planning for the Grammy Awards, neither of which is true. We are a, not, we are a um, not-for-profit trade organization designed to serve the interests of the, of, of the music-making community, and we operate um, as an academy all year long with things like you know, trying to put music back in schools, advocating on Capitol Hill for artist rights and intellectual property protection. Uh, we also do roughly about 150 events throughout the year through all of our chapters that are nationwide. And you know, our one big event of the year, the Grammy Awards, has become our, it's the jewel in our crown, and in a lot of ways it's become our calling card. But I would say that um, while there are certain elements that we prepare for all year long, including, you know, putting putting together our marketing partnerships and our sponsorships, because that takes quite a while to negotiate, uh, there's, there's many other things that I'm involved with uh, beyond simply putting on um, that one special night in February. And I think that's an excellent way. I'm sure you get asked that question a lot and trying to explain what the Grammys does. It's certainly a leader in, um, in events now, which is no big surprise that we are so connected to music. And I've, I've interviewed you lots of times. And every year there's something new to talk about um, with your event. But I want to step back a little bit. You just returned, actually, from Colorado, which is uh, where I've spent, you know, certainly a lot of time. That's where you and I met. You're a big fan of Colorado. You graduated um from the University of Colorado in Boulder. Um, you're on the board there. And you you have a, a love for Colorado, but um, you've, you've done a lot of other things since graduation, including you worked for Disney, you worked for Sony Pictures and theatrical marketing. And when you joined the Grammys, um, which a lot of people I think might find interesting, is there actually wasn't a marketing department. There was no marketing prior to your uh, coming on board with the Grammys. I mean, that's 
that's pretty remarkable that um, they wouldn't have marketing, right? Well, you know, 10, 11 years ago, um, you know, the Academy, we're now, we're now 56 years old. So, you know, 11 years ago, we were about 45 years old. And, you know, we operated as a very conservative, traditional trade organization uh, for over four decades with a show that continued to grow and grow. And in a lot of ways, we built this um, enormously resonant or enormously popular brand almost by accident, um, by virtue of having a television show that really um, captivated people around the world. And so the vision was and the idea was that, that we need to start a marketing department and take a proactive brand management approach because if we can build a brand of this size and global importance um, on the virtue of a single television event held once per year, how meaningful and, um, and relevant could we become if we took a proactive brand management approach for 365 days out of the year? And, um, you know, it's been, it's been quite a journey. And, and what we originally did was we would sort of do all of these institutional, philanthropic, music, industry-related activities all throughout the year. And then when the telecast came around, we abdicated responsibility to market um, to market, quote, our show to our network partner, and I think they did a, a fine job, but they didn't really understand the essence and the, and the three-dimensional DNA of who we are and what we really stood for. And so what we had to do is, is, is take a step back and, um, and reformat and restructure and re- revision, re-envision, I should say, um, kind of who we are as a brand and what we wanted to communicate because the show – was more than a show. The show represented our brand and the show represented how we were seen and how we were perceived all throughout the year by, you know, hundreds of millions of people. So it became really incumbent upon us and really important um, to take that, uh, to take more of a definitive leadership role in the direction that we were taking um, as a globally iconic brand. And I think the first time that we talked about the Grammys, you and I, back several years ago, was this huge increase that you saw. I mean, you, you expressed to me that one of the challenges you had at that point was reaching millennials and continuing to be relevant. You saw a huge jump in Nielsen ratings. I want to say back then it was like 34, 35%. Is that, is that right? Well, over the course of the last 10, 11 years, we've seen a steady increase in ratings. And, uh, you know, and, and ratings really, from my perspective, are not necessarily the short-term objectives, uh, the short-term objective. Ratings, just like social sentiment and just like, um, you know, popularity, are really the consequence of, of the brand work that we do on the front end. And I think if we are really respectful to our audience and deliver a message that's credible all throughout the year, we're going to create a more engaged audience and we're going to be rewarded by a deeper engagement, a deeper affinity, um, greater viewership, um, you know, stronger sentiment, all of those key metrics that, that, that have become kind of standard KPI. Um, those really are, those really are the, um, the end result of, of a lot of years of, of kind of strategic redirection. You've done a great job using social media every year. And I would think, you know, because you've been recognized for being such a leader in the space and um, you, you've been consistent um, increasing those numbers every year, how do you try to outdo yourself for the next year? I mean, is there some sort of measurement? Is it creating different content? I mean, how do you solve with your staff, what you're going to do to continue to grow the event and engage people? Well, I think, you know, one of the, one of the, the, the key um, focuses that really drives myself and my team is the idea that, you know, several years ago we sort of hit upon this universal human truth, and especially, I think it's especially relevant as we, as we relate to, to social media, which is, you know, generally people are looking for two things. They're looking for discovery and they're looking to be part of a community. And so if we are able to, um, if we can enable the idea of discovery that leads to shareability, we, we kind of empower greater engagement and that ultimately leads to building a greater, uh, more involved 
community. And what we try to do on a daily basis through a respectful two-way communication with our with our friends, fans, and followers is try to include um, innovation in everything that we do. And I think innovation has, you know, innovation with a big eye and innovation with a small eye. From our standpoint, you know, small innovation is simply um, adding adding, you know, interesting points of trivia to a daily conversation, all the way up to something that's that's quite a bit bigger, which is an involved and engaged, um, you know, interactive participatory streaming experience around the Grammys that we were the first the first award show to kind of pioneer for, I think it's five years ago. So it really, it, it's, it's not necessarily about finding ways to top ourselves from a, from a stunt standpoint. It really is continuing to, um, to try and layer in, um, you know, more, more credibility and more interesting elements of, of that dialogue. And that takes us in some very interesting directions. So you've got 2.3 million, um, we were just showing your Facebook page, and you've got 2.3 million fans on Facebook. You've got 1.48 million followers on Twitter, which is a lot. You, you, you definitely used Twitter a lot this last event to really get people excited. There's this whole second screen dimension. You know, um, Brian, you work a lot in not just the music space, but in the social media space as well. H- how do you look at the fact that they've got so many fans and followers is that really important or is it the content i mean what do you think is important for an event like the grammys brian well i i think um i think the number of fans is not nearly as important as as the number of engaged fans right so you know any follower number is going to have a a soft part of it where people liked it or followed uh once and haven't come back since Um, and i actually think it's you know, it's an interesting challenge for, for the Grammy folks. I'd, I'd be interested, Evan, in your thoughts on this, but certainly the, the viewership for and the buzz around an event like the Grammys once a year is is far larger than the numbers that uh, you have in your social following. And, and those are significant numbers in your social following as it is by compared to what a lot of brands and a lot of organizations have been able to achieve. You know, but, but how do you think about, you know, an event like, the the Grammys being a true feeder for longer term, deeper engagement. I know you're active all year now, but you know, have you guys cracked the nut or figured out how to get more people from uh, watching the show, tuning in, buzzing about that incredible performance to to actually being followers or or to being an engaged follower? Well, it's. It, I think it's an interesting question, and and what I would do is I would I would flip that 180 degrees and say that rather than use the Grammys as a feeder to jumpstart a greater um, a greater social conversation, we look at it as having an engaged conversation all year long that ultimately drives towards the Grammy Awards. Um, you know, I, I take the position that you know we have things that happen on our stage that not only don't happen anywhere else, but haven't even been envisioned or considered by other by other people, other shows, other brands. And you know what I think? I think the show is fantastic, and we put on entertainment, um, you know, bar second to none. However, I think that the the job of the the, the job of marketing is to really get people to 8 o'clock. And I think the job of the show is to keep them till 1130. And so by having a respectful two-way conversation all throughout the year, we, it, rather than start a conversation in December when nominations come out and hammer people with push messaging to say, watch the Grammys, watch the Grammys, watch the Grammys, we are talking to people all year long and creating and adding to that music community, um, you know, throughout the year, so that when the show comes, it's not such a hard start, and it's not, you know, it's not a doesn't feel like a sales job. It feels like the extension and the continuation of an ongoing dialogue. Obviously, a big point, a big part, a big culmination from a year-long conversation. But, but there's there's always going to be an afterglow excitement effect after the Grammys. But I don't think that you're going to you're going to keep people engaged from that one moment of of heightened emotion all throughout the year. I think it's got to go the other way. I think you have to you have to lead people 
lead is the wrong is the wrong um, choice of words. But I think you have to engage people throughout the year so that when the Grammys come, it's a natural extension of the dialogue. And then that's, I think, the way to to extend it. You had um, I think I'm looking here at the numbers. Uh, 15.7 million mentions on Twitter during the broadcast. And at, at the peak, when you had um, Lamar and Imagine Dragons perform, mm-hmm. I think, 171,593 tweets per minute, which, which is a lot. How does something like that translate into revenue for whether it's your advertisers on uh, the main screen, which is the television screen where people are watching the event? How does that translate? Well, it's not a it's not a direct correlation necessarily, but you know, there's different sources there's different sources of revenue. You know, CBS is responsible, who's our broadcast partner, they're responsible for um, for the advertising revenue. The Recording Academy, you know, one of the one of the key areas that we um, where we generate additional revenue is through marketing partnerships and the revenue that's generated ultimately helps to go to programming and we feed it back into um, into the music industry and use that money to send more kids to Grammy camp etc but the more engagement there is and the more excitement there is about our brand um, the more interested and eager brands are to want to partner with us and and tie in to the cultural excitement that we're able to generate and so you know for for many years, it was um, you know it was quite an involved dialogue to secure marketing partners, and and marketing partners are are, are different than telecast advertisers, right? When when I talk about marketing partners, I'm talking about partners that that have the ability to market in association with the Grammy brand off network, so leading up to the show, and and um, you know that. Those partnerships, we're in business now with some of the biggest, most robust, meaningful brands on the planet. And now that, you know, we have a certain degree of success under our belt, um, you know, people are starting to, well, not starting, but for the last several years, our phone's actually been starting to ring from a number of brands that want to support music and want to be a part of what we're creating, as opposed to for many years, um, trying to figure out how we're going to find partners to help us market. You know, this is a challenge that you have every year. And I, this is coming up in the chat over and over again, which is um, something that I know you personally don't have any control over, but is continuing to be an issue as we use so many different screens. As you know, in the past, if you didn't see the event, um, it was okay. But now that we have social media and Twitter and we find out who won, the event before we just didn't watch the news, you know, so we just didn't watch the news until we actually saw the event. But now Mm -hmm. um, with time delay, now that I'm a West Coaster, I experience this myself. The question is, how do you, you know, why isn't the event um, live for both? And and I know you can't answer this probably directly, but maybe you have some insight on why it isn't live at the same time. Why is there a time delay? Well, you know, it's a great question, and, it, and it's and it's a question that we um, that we consider, um, you know, we consider every year. And I think, you know, from our standpoint, we have to we have to work within the programming guidelines and parameters of our network partner. And you know, I think the feeling is that the excitement that builds about some of these once in a lifetime performances from East to West, as the show, you know, the show will go live to the East Coast, and then, it, and then it will, you know, every hour, it will then travel, um, you know, on the calendar, um, you know, towards the West Coast. And I think that when, you know, while people like live, live, the idea of building anticipation and creating, um, you know, social uh, excitement around something that's happened on television, it creates anticipation for the people that haven't yet seen it. And CBS has had this event since 1973. I think it started with NBC and then ABC and then CBS has managed the event. But networks, you know, they still have, you know, the revenue dollars. You and I have talked about this, why why you don't stream the actual event. You have lots of other content that you create. You know, I want to switch this to you, Brian, because You've <laughs> you've worked with a lot of different types of music events as well as sporting events, and this continues to be a question. What are your thoughts on this, Brian? 
Well, I mean, I, I think the last great, uh, you know, destination viewing type of event is live television. Um, I grew up on the West Coast. I'm spoiled uh, to live on the East Coast now in the sense that, you know, everything is geared towards being live for us. Even, even you know, international soccer matches are aired live at 6 o'clock in the morning in New York um, because we know how uh, significant and influential the, the East Coast audience is. Not to say that the West Coast audience isn't, but, you know, there's a, there's a media bias in particular uh, with, with thought leaders and influence on the East Coast. I mean, you know, if you look, for example, at what Jimmy Fallon is doing right now, um, the, the ratings for The Tonight Show are up, but the online attention being paid to the bits that he posts on YouTube is extraordinary as well. So if, if the content is good, uh, you know, I think the Grammys can have it both ways. Uh, and I'm, you know, OK with that, uh, at least as someone living on the East Coast. Uh, who who gets to see it live? I'm okay with that. I'm not sure if I'd have a different tune if I was, you know, still growing up in Seattle and in LA or whatever. But the idea that yes, people will tune in to see these extraordinary events happen when they happen. But if you hear something is extraordinary, I'm probably still going to tune in uh, or log on, I should say, and, and watch it. Um, watch it, you know, on YouTube, uh, which actually relates. Um, I, I hate to, you know, put you under the the thumb screws, Evan, but I'm, I'm actually curious in relation to the conversation that's going on today uh, with the National Basketball Association and, and the Clippers, you know, how, how much the, you know, the extracurricular activities of, of your artists, of the companies that, you know, you guys represent uh, plays into things. So, I mean, you, you guys have gotten a bump on the show, on the Grammy show each year by, you know, some crazy things happening and, you know, some profanity being thrown around or, you know, two people you wouldn't expect to kiss, kissing, whatever, you know, uh, anticipation people might have what could happen in the Grammys um, or the MTV Awards in that case. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious if you're if you're watching what's going on, for example, with the NBA today and how sponsors are, you know, deciding to or to not engage uh, because of things that are beyond your control and, and how that plays into your thinking now. List. Well, I mean, I think um, I don't I don't see that the two situations is necessarily analogous, but you do raise a good point, which is that, um, you know, partners, marketing partners are very sensitive um, to what's going on in culture. And the Recording Academy takes a position, you know, we don't, we don't support one artist over another artist. We don't, you know, we try, you know, the position that we take in the marketplace and on Capitol Hill is always one of supporting the, um, the intellectual property rights of the creative community. And we don't necessarily represent artists. We're not a union. Um, we don't negotiate on behalf of artists. We, we represent the creative community as a whole. So, you know, if something, if something were to happen that the general public finds offensive, um, they certainly have the right to reach out to some of our marketing partners and express their displeasure. But we found that that has been um, incredibly limited in the past, there have probably been, you know, a handful of people who have had a challenge or a problem with, let's say, something that's happened on the telecast. They didn't like that, and so they wanted their voice to be heard um, by our marketing partners. But I certainly think that, you know, it, it, it would be a, um, uh, you know, we would never be involved in something that's happened along the lines of what you're currently seeing in the NBA. It's just, we're not, we're not structured like that. We're not set up like that. We don't, you know, we don't have ownership issues. We don't employ people. Um, and you know, our position, our whole reason for existence is to support the creative community. And we're talking about this, like, again, this is one event that you put on. It does take a lot of time for you to put it on, but you do a lot of other things for the music industry as a whole, working with children. I mean, you know, there are a lot of other initiatives for the Recording Academy that are, are incredibly beneficial to music, right, Evan? Yeah, absolutely. We, be, you know, think about it like this. The Grammy Awards are, um, they are the culmination of the important work that the Recording Academy does for the industry 
all year long. As I touched on earlier, these, uh, this work includes things like trying to bring um, music programs back, to sco- back into schools to empower the next generation of music makers to find their voice, um, to work on, uh, on legislation that ultimately helps um, ensure that music makers continue to get paid for creating art and creating music that, that ends up um, providing enjoyment and nourishment, creative nourishment to, to the world. Um, you know, we also help artists in need at a variety of, of levels, whether it's economic, whether it's, uh, whether it's health issues, whether it's addiction recovery. Um, you know, the Recording Academy is involved in, in, in all kinds of, um, all kinds of efforts that that are there really to um, to to give back and to support music and to make sure that music continues to survive. What is the amplifier stage? Um, talk about that for a second. The amplifier. Well, we we have we have a program that we created. You know, a lot of people, many people, look at us as the organization that hands out uh, you know golden statues to the best artists in the world one night a year. But the Recording Academy is involved in supporting artists at all levels all throughout the world, I'm sorry, all throughout the year. And so we created a platform called Center Stage Amplifier, where we built, uh, we built a digital platform on, um, uh, through the, using the, um, uh, I want to say sound, uh, sound stage, um, technology where emerging artists, I'm sorry, SoundCloud, Sorry, a brain freeze. Where emerging artists can upload their music and have the opportunity for for other fans as well as high level A list celebrity artists to hear this music and share it socially with um, with their social ecosystem. So it really gives people an opportunity to take their music and have it amplified and have it heard by a lot more people than, than they normally would, would potentially have access to. This is the second year that we're doing the program, and um, you know, we, we expect to continue it for, for quite a while because we think that it is important to try and give emerging artists more of a platform um, you know, to get recognized. I think this is huge. This is one of the things I'm most excited about because what you saw with this when, you know, quote unquote, social platform, social media started was that really artists and back in the MySpace days had this opportunity, right, to connect with fans in a way that they never did. And now that this space is so full of all types of other content and all types of other people, I don't think that it's not as obvious that they're connecting, but you've actually, uh, through the, through the Recording Academy, through the, through your event, the Grammys, and, uh, you, you've given artists that need a, a want, have a desire to be recognized. You know, Brian, what would you say about that? You work with some pretty big artists, Brian, like Puff Daddy, uh, or is it Sean Combs? What are we calling him these days? Well, when, when we're talking music, it's Puff Daddy. So you were, you were correct there. <laughs> so what when is, we're talking other things, it's Diddy. Diddy? Okay. So what is what is you know, what is it, the opportunity that you see for smaller artists? Because I mean, obviously the big artists are already getting that recognition. I mean, what do you see as the opportunity besides this program that the Grammy's putting on, which again, I think is, is excellent. Well, I, I think that was a big part of the vision behind, um, Mr. Combs's launching of revolt, the music network, um, that, uh, that went up in October and uh, just had its first upfront, uh, et cetera, last week. And, you know, he would say uh, revolt is social by design. It's totally connected to, you know, the, the young people who are driving the music conversation. And instead of, you know, picking whether it's based on data or gut feel who the next big stars are going to be, it, it's really – uh, you know, focused on discovery. It's focused on finding those incredible emerging acts, uh, whether they're playing on YouTube or in some uh, small club somewhere. So I, I think there's two parts to it. You know, one is that you, you do have to give a forum, you have to give a, a mechanism for uh, people with incredible musical talent or vision to be discovered first and foremost. And then second, you have to you have to be able to amplify it in some way, and I, I actually think it's the latter part that has not entirely been figured out um, by anyone in the music industry. In the sense that uh, forever the music industry has known how to create big stars, they've known how to become kingmakers. 
Um, we, I think the industry now understands or is getting much better at the discovery piece and sort of flattening out the, the identification of talent. But I think there's probably some new model or new approach to connecting those two because they're just, there aren't going to be, you know, that many Beyonce's in the world. Uh, there aren't going to be, uh, you know, enough, there aren't going to be enough super gigantic hits. Um, so we have to find a way to make, uh, if you take a sports analogy, sort of more money ball. We have to find more, you know, doubles and triples, um, not just satisfy ourselves with singles or expect everything can be a home run. We got to, we got to, you know, we got to produce some mid, some mid-level big excitement from these emerging artists. Well, and I think there's so many artists out there, and there's so much, there's so much noise, and it's, it's, it's tough to break through as an artist. And I think, you know, one of the things that we think about um, quite a bit here at the Academy is that, you know, the music industry has shifted so much that, um, you know, there's never been more music available to more people across more formats in more genres, and there's never been fewer people to get paid to make music. And so anything that we can do to help um, shift that dynamic uh, is something that the Recording Academy is interested in doing. You know, let's talk about the brand for a second, because we're talking about the brand of the Grammys, but what about the brand of the artists? And, you know, you kind of alluded to this before a little bit, Brian, when you talked about even the leadership of a sports organization or maybe even the players, whether it's artists um, misbehaving or behaving badly or behaving well, you know, um, Pharrell, for example, who's built his brand on happy and crying in an interview with Oprah, which is kind of amazing. How important is the artist brand in their success and net sales? You think, uh, Evan? Well, I mean, I think that, that, uh, that the artists today are, um, more of a, of a quote brand than, than they've ever been. And in a lot of ways, they have to they have to be mindful of that and consider that that they are a brand. Um, some artist brands are, you know, as you said, happy, and some artist brands are 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 more rough around the edges. And I think it it, it really has to do with understanding your audience, understanding your constituency, and how you sort of serve, um, you know, serve an image to that particular group and it, it sounds very clinical and I don't mean it to but the way that the market is, you know has evolved you know consumers and fans are far more um, engaged they're far more um, accessible and in a lot of ways they're more demanding and cynical than they've ever been and so you can't you can't go through your life and your career without regard to how you're being you know perceived by by your audience. And I think that, um, you know, Pharrell is a, is a great example. I mean, before, before the world knew who he is this year, a lot of people knew who he was through NERD and, and, and some of his, some of his past work and some of his, his producer credits. Um, but I do think that, that artists by definition nowadays, um, have crafted a particular image that fans associate with and identify with. And I think that, that there's an authenticity that's important. And if you, if you appear or smell to be inauthent inauthentic, I think that's when people really lose interest and turn away. I think that's an excellent way to put it. Being authentic is exactly what I think, you know, we, we talk about people hiding behind their computers or not being uh, able to, you know, be themselves. But actually, I think that's quite the opposite. I think you see the freedom of the artists. And sometimes even if they're behaving badly, they still have a lot of support. What do you say that, Brian? You've worked with some artists who are behaving badly from time to time. And you seem to walk the straight and narrow yourself. But, um, but how important is the personal brand of the artist to you, Brian? Well, I, I think the authenticity of the personal brand is more important than uh, a person being a, a good person or a bad person. Um, I think you have seen, you know, artists and athletes build very successful careers around personalities and behaviors that uh, almost, whether it's unintentional or it's by design, you know, are certainly not the norm, not the mainstream. Um, I actually uh, was sitting at lunch yesterday and overheard a conversation at the table next to me um, about uh, Adele and how part of uh, this person's theory, part of the reason that Adele 
uh, you know, has been so successful is not just because she is a talented singer, but because Amy Winehouse uh, passed away, you know, tragically from a drug overdose. And Adele, as the as the voice of, you know, kind of British music or, or you know, global music coming out of the UK or whatever, it was such an opposite to Amy Winehouse and her, you know, hard charge in ways that that part of her brand was established simply as a contrast to what made Amy Winehouse so compelling and so extraordinary. And, you know, I'm not sure that I entirely buy that logic, but, you know, both Amy Winehouse and Adele were extraordinarily talented and extraordinarily successful and could not have been more opposite, I think, in terms of uh, their quote unquote brand. So it's it's not just about being a good person or a bad person. It is about uh, having a personality and being being true to that. And more so than anything, I think in um, in music, where performance is the name of the game. If you're an athlete and you're you know an a hole off the court, it doesn't matter if you can shoot the three or if you can hit home runs. At the end of the day, that's what people show up to. See. You do is help your team win a championship, but. People buy concert tickets and watch music videos and download albums and, you know, invest in T-shirts or whatever because they they want that music experience. And that music experience is both what you produce with your voice or an instrument, but also, you know, the way you shake it. So, Evan, you've been um, with the Grammys now since 2002. Uh, congratulations on your um, on the Grammys in their 56th year. You've been a leader, though, among other heads of marketing, and certainly you get you know have a lot of admiration by a lot of other marketers and how you've you know continued to grow the Grammy as a brand, a really respected brand, one that could have easily faded out, uh, certainly with millennials and the younger generation. But you've continued to make it a really exciting um, place for artists and musicians. How much pressure is that as a, as a marketer? And how do you think about what you're going to do next? Because, okay, now I have to top my own personal achievement. I mean, how do you do that? Well, first of all, thank you for, for, for those kind words. And I, I would say that, you know, there's certainly a lot of people here at the Academy beyond me that had um, a pretty big hand in, in our overall success. Uh, I kind of see myself and, and the marketing department here as the brand stewards and really, um, on on some level, being the agent of change for a traditional organization like, or or, or a um, you know a normally traditional organization like the Recording Academy, and I think you know it it it's all you know there's there's this real um, the the panic moment for me normally comes Monday morning after the Grammy Awards after we've done really well, where I get up really early and I'm kind of pacing and I want to get all the numbers that I can about how well the telecast did and what some of the social numbers were, are looking like. And um, fortunately, over the last number of years, it, it's been, you know, the numbers have been um, very encouraging and satisfying and gratifying on Monday morning. And after a couple of minutes of, um, a, a, of feeling, you know, a, a bit of, of, happiness and pride, then I start to get really anxious about what do we do next year and how do we try and continue to evolve. And I don't think that it's necessarily how do we do something bigger and better and how do we find, how do we do more stunts and how do we get, you know, more people to necessarily watch the show. It's how do we continually try to maintain credibility and how do we continue, you know, in the, in the face of success, one of the challenges from a brand and a marketing standpoint is um, you start to become, you, you start to get pressure from a lot of outside entities and sources to say, well, you have to top yourself, you have to do better, you have to push and you have to do more things and you have to, you know, create more, more sponsorship opportunities. And that's really the fine line that we have to walk. How do we maintain a credible voice while not appearing to quote sell out? Um, you know, to, to to always try and build and grow and expand. And it's a it's a it's a real delicate. You know, it's a fine line and it's a balancing act that that we have to walk. And we always have to weigh what we're doing um, against the idea of are we celebrating music, and are we going too far from a brand standpoint? Because for us. You know, there's a lot of brands out there that have no consequence for, you know, taking a greater commercial 
role in you know any form that that may take. But given the fact that we have this this almost you know sixty years of of credibility and heritage, the downside for us of of making a wrong move far outweighs the short term upside. And so that's the thing that I've always got to be thinking about, and that's the thing that kind of keeps me up at night saying, you know, is what we're doing respectful to the brand and ultimately respectful to the industry? So I get this question a lot from artists who are trying to get noticed, and they know they need to be using social media. I know this is a really kind of, you know, grassroots uh, question for either of you, really. But this is this keeps coming up in the chat room, and that is uh, Facebook promoted posts. Do they use YouTube? Where should an artist start who's a songwriter, a performer, and they really want some sort of, you know, notice, you know, notice in, in the fan, in fan base? They maybe won't get want to get people to listen to their music. Where should they put their efforts? I mean, either of you have any thoughts on that? I'll uh, let me let me offer two um, as the. From the fan perspective, not the not the you know music experts perspective. Um, one is you know I, I will put in a plug for Revolt, and they're not the only ones, but I think Revolt is definitely one example where uh, there are increasingly platforms, radio platforms, digital platforms. Um, in Revolt's case, digital and television that are you know that are actively looking for people who believe they're talented, and not in a gimmicky way, um, not in a you know, let's pitch you against each other for good reality television purposes type of way. They're they're looking for great voices, and they they have people with expertise who can help, um, you know, elevate that. So so I would look for the platforms that are interested in that. Um, the other thing I would say is, um, I think if you if you produce, you know, solid music and you uh, and you hustle and you create the opportunities for the, sh- you know, for a great show experience or for a great you know, music video and you put it up on YouTube. YouTube's a great place. Number two, search. Number one, search place for music. It's wonderful. But I would also look at things, honestly, like Kickstarter, because I think the biggest reason that people want and need to be discovered is uh, to get the funding to go and do more music and better work or to launch a tour. And I think there are audiences out there and, and obviously the power of kind of the social connections that if you put out an offer and say, I need $10,000 to you know, buy a van again and drive around and hit a bunch of Midwestern states and play a bunch of local clubs. Um, I think there are people out there, if if they like your music and they like the hustle, you know, will back you for that. And I I think there's a way to build yourself and build your independence through sort of social fundraising now or, or, or social investment that, um, you know, that don't rely you to kind of, you know, go to these big kingmakers anymore and, and hope to be the one that breaks through the system. So, Evan, how do you look at this uh, topic? Because you are um, an industry support for artists who, I mean, how do you approach this the other 364 days of the year? Well, you know, we approach it on a couple of levels. I mean, you know, my my position and my kind of charge here, as I touched on a little bit earlier, is to really be the steward of the brand. There's a lot of really smart people here at the Academy who are responsible for making sure that we continue to do the important work that the Recording Academy has become known for throughout the industry. The way, the way that I really see my greatest value and my greatest benefit here at the Academy is in the area of really strengthening um, the, the relevance and the resonance of the Grammy brand. Because if I can do that, in a lot of ways, you know, it's sort of the, the rising tide lifts all boats mentality. If, if more people care, if more people are familiar, have a deeper affinity and care more about the Grammy brand, then when our, leg, when our um, you know, when our representatives on Capitol Hill go to speak to legislators about a, a piece of, of, you know, IP legislation, those legislators are going to be more familiar with who we are and what we do, and they will have a stronger feeling about the Grammys as an organization. When we try and, and you know fundraise for the Grammy Foundation, which is one of our charitable philanthropic arms, people are going to become they're going to be more familiar and more comfortable with what we stand for. From a membership standpoint, we've got over twenty thousand. Um, you know, we have a twenty thousand strong membership body of music makers 
of all varying levels from, you know, globally iconic artists to artists that just released their first record. Um, you know, it's going to make membership in the Academy that much more interesting and that much more desirable. So from my standpoint throughout the year, it's really uh, a constant uh, focus on how do we respectfully and to use a really overused cliche, organically, um, you know, drive the brand, um, you know, deeper into people's consciousness. We all have people that are our peers that we admire, or people that we look at as whether it's just a brand that you think is doing a great job. Who do you, who would you like to, you know, meet, or who do you think is doing a good job in um, in marketing today as a, as far as a brand? You you talking to me? I am talking to you, Evan. Um, you know, it's there's it's a it's a really interesting question. I think it's a great question. I think there's a number of brands that are doing some really, um, some really smart things. Um, you know, and it, and it, it, it runs the gamut. I mean, I see pieces of, of creative that I'm really taken by, um, that I think have, you know, really, um, hit on, uh, you know, some really smart, um, really s smart things to, to, to connect with consumers. I mean, you know, over the course of the last year or so, I think the, the Volvo, um, the Volvo truck ad with Jean-Claude Van Damme was, was great. I think it was really smart. I think the, um, you know, the, the, the quintessential example of creating brand affinity, I have to, you know, I have to point to Apple because they've not only created, um, you know, they've not only created an ecosystem that works, but they've created a culture that works. And that's not just from an advertising standpoint, that's from kind of a brand DNA standpoint. Um, you know, I think that there's a, there's a, I, I think frankly, what, what Maserati is doing right now is, is, is pretty interesting in how they're trying to reposition who they are and what they do to a, a particular demographic. Um, you know, I, I think it's, I'm just a, in a lot of ways, I, I consider myself a fan and a student of, of, of marketing, and I just love to see great creative work. Shiat Day is still your agency of record, right? Yeah, yeah, they're the agency that, that you know, created the, the Apple, um, you know, the Apple mentality and the Apple efforts. They, you know, they, they do Gatorade. They've done, you know, they've done some of the biggest brands and biggest campaigns ever. And, and they're excellent. They do a great job. You talked about the... Um, and, and I think, you know, by you pointing out even the John claude Van Damme spot is a very theatrical approach, which is, we've talked about this on the show before, as opposed to like this kind of funny, uh, you know, comedic approach. And these, 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 these ads not only are great, you know, television ads, but they, they go viral because people are very interested in the quality of the content. That said, why, you know, so I get certainly the benefit of using an agency like Shiat Day because they're great. Have you considered or would you consider using a boutique agency, some, somebody smaller that can really focus on you as maybe a single client? I mean, where does your, as a, as a head of marketing, where is your thought process in choosing an agency to represent uh, your brand? I don't think the size of the agency really um, is a big determining factor for me. It really comes down to vision and passion. And, you know, the reason that, that, that Shiat Day is such a cherished partner of, of the Recording Academy, they've been, our, they've been in, um, you know, on our side for now close to seven years, um, is because they're really driven by the passion of music and the passion of the work and the, and the conversations that we have are so engaged about what we want to achieve. And it's not just about creating an ad. It's not just about creating a campaign. It's about creating something that's meaningful, um, culturally. And if you look at the campaigns that we've created and you put those up relative to, you know, other people in our quote category, um, on the award show, um, you know, matrix, there really is no comparison. It's, you know, other shows are really flat and two dimensional and, and essentially say, uh, you know, watch, watch X award show and you'll see your favorite stars. Well, there's a there's a narrative storytelling approach in our relationship with Shia Day, where you know we we take people down a path, and we weave a story, and we we craft a narrative about you know getting to the Grammy stage, getting to music's biggest night, 
instead of just throwing up a bunch of, you know, celebrity artist performers on stage, which, you know, is pretty, pretty standard. Um, we want to go, we want to go a bit deeper and engage people. And, you know, from my standpoint, you know, one of the funnest things about marketing is the ability to surprise people and excite people and, um, the ability to have people look twice at what you're doing. And that to me is really, you know, what, what great marketing is all about for people to say, huh, I, I didn't know that. I didn't, you know, hadn't thought about that or that's really interesting and something that doesn't just fade away into the background. Brian, what can we expect to see from Revolt? Um, what's, why should we be paying attention to what they're doing and what can we, what, what remains to be seen? Um, well, I think it's, I think it's a couple things. Um, you know, one is that I, I think you will see new and different voices. Um, you know, and I, I say this as probably a casual music fan uh, in my household. We we probably are listening to, you know, show tunes and things like that on Pandora more than the latest stuff because we have kids and, you know, you never know what you're going to get sometimes. Um, so I think you're going to see new voices and new artists and, and new types of music uh, emerge. So if, if you're paying attention to revolt, you're going to get a diversity of perspectives. Um, I also think you're going to see really an expanded view of music, which I think to a certain extent is lacking, uh, in terms of the vision of many in the music industry. Um, not, not Evan and the Grammy folks, I think, but a lot of the, you know, production houses and, and whatnot. And, and by that, I mean, you know, music is one of the ultimate connectors. It is a universal language. So you're seeing extraordinary things at, music festivals, um, electronic music festivals, Coachella, whatever. Um, you're seeing extraordinary things in the technology field. You're seeing music integrated into, uh, you know, sports and culture and education in ways that, uh, you know, I don't think people imagined before. So, you know, we, c we can't just put music in a box or the music industry in a box and, and scrutinize it. We have to look at music as one of those things that stretches across um, genres and verticals and over borders. And so I think you're going to see revolt, you know, push that perspective that it's, it's music first and, and audience first and, you know, social at DNA and, you know, where the music goes, revolt will follow as opposed to, you know, we've got some skin in the game. So we're going to promote a certain type of music or a certain artist um, and, and try to define the entire field of music around, you know, what was in a personal interest. Um, so I think it's just a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's embracing what's wonderful about music. Well, if you look at, even like if you think about the bare naked ladies who um, have been kind of pioneers as far as artists in the social media space, they've done, um, they continue to stay engaged. I'd love to get them on Twitter actually, but they, they've been an artist that have been around for a long time. Who's do, who's doing things like that? That's a newer artist that you see, um, Brian. Um, well, you know, one, I don't know that they're a new artist, um, but they might be new to a lot of people. But I, I think what They Might Be Giants have done for many, many years is really extraordinary and um, how how they've evolved, right? So when they started out, they were a bunch of guys who were having fun and writing these great sort of quirky and occasionally iconic songs. As they grew up and had children, you know, they said, wow, I, why don't we do a children's album? <laughs> you know, as technology created opportunities you know, they started to put out, uh, you know, podcasts and, and weekly releases online of new songs or new attempts at songs. So they have this incredibly loyal community of fans that, you know, may have come in for different reasons, but have been able to grow with them. That's one. And then, um, uh, you know, I mean, I think there are a lot of, you know, little independent artists, um, you know, one I'm a fan of, because I saw her in a, a church basement, you know, five years ago. And, you know, now she's gone pretty big time is, is Ingrid Michaelson. And, you know, I don't, I don't know the ins and outs of, of Ingrid's operation. Um, she was at an event that I was working on a few weeks ago and all of that, but you know, she's, she's someone who writes her songs and still has her same, you know, two or three support musicians. And, you know, up until she got a couple songs picked up by a commercial and, you know, was able to, upgrade her travel a little bit, you know, put her guitar in the back of her car and drove around from show to show to show and got on Twitter and got Facebook and just promoted the hell out of herself and until people realized that she had a certain vibe and a voice and a perspective that they wanted. So, I, you know, I don't know that it's 
it's super fancy, high tech, extraordinary. But I think both of those examples, they might be Giants and Ingrid Michaelson, just showed, you know, if, if you're smart and you're patient and you're hungry, you know, we do live in a world with technology as an amplifier and accelerator where you can achieve. If you go out there and you put something on YouTube and you shake your fist at the moon and say, you know, why am I not? You know, getting picked up and done all this stuff, you know, you're you're probably uh, looking at technology and the role that it can play in what you're doing, you know, not entirely correctly. I think that's good. A good point. Uh, so Evan, th- he makes a really good point. We've seen the music industry evolve over time. What do you think is the next big thing? What what are we seeing? <laughs> I, I think it's it's so hard to try and, you know, prognosticate what's coming next. I mean, you know, five years ago, who would have ever thought Twitter would be what it is today? Four years ago, who would have thought, you know, Instagram what it is what it is today? Three years ago, who would have thought the same about Pinterest? I think it's, I think it's impossible to really kind of figure out and determine what's next for technology and, and, and what's next for music. I think that, you know, a... Um, you know, a, a universal truth is that good music will will stand the test of time, and I think those artists that really make great music um, will ultimately stand out. And I think, you know, to the point you made earlier, it's become more than more important than ever to create a um, a social following. And a lot of times, when artists get signed by labels, you know, labels are not doing a ton of marketing anymore. You have to be your own marketer as well. You have to come to the table with a social media ecosystem that's already that's already built and that's already robust and you have an obligation based on your label agreement to um, y- y- you know to to post and 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 tweet a certain number of times to keep those fans engaged so I think it's you know the, the one change that I don't think we are will be reversed is that um, it's becoming more and more incumbent on the individual to drive their own um, you know, to, to, to be uh, an influence on their own success. So reality shows that have music or even dramas like Nashville, which I'm a big fan of, um, don't judge me. Do either one of you watch Nashville? Totally. <laughs> Mrs. Coates on it. Come on. I knew you would come, come through for I, me, Brian. I, I do not. I must admit I do not. <laughs> I kind of had a feeling that you didn't, Evan. But it's a great show, and they have a lot of uh, new music that comes out, and I get interested in some of the music. And then you have reality shows, um, you know, whether it's American Idol or whatever the show is, how important is reality television or television in general, uh, mainstream television and promoting artists work or getting people excited about the music industry? Brian, I think it's, I, okay. oh, sorry, go ahead. No, Evan, Evan. Yeah. No, go, go first. I, I have an <laughs> no, answer, you, but go for it. Uh, okay. Well, I would say, I mean, I don't know how you rank the level of importance for, for one, um, one element versus another. I think it plays a role. I think it plays a role in getting in building awareness and creating a bit of amplification. Um, you know, if you're if you're fortunate enough to have your to have your song, you know, be part of the opening credit sequence of a major TV show, you know, by by a lot of by a lot of standards, you're pretty much done. You've arrived, and and you know, you now have you know a certain revenue stream that you can count on. With with the exception of those kinds of really amazing, amazing opportunities. Um, you know, it, it's just, it's another piece in the overall awareness puzzle. Good point. I, Brian, I, do you have two cents on I, that? Yeah, well, I, I, I totally agree with that. And I would go one step further, which is, you know, I would, I would not consider myself, uh, you know, an elite music fan. You know, I'm not sitting there and just listening to music on a consistent basis, but it is, definitely in the background of many different aspects of my life. And so to have it integrated across different media institution as a great example of that, it, it adds an important layer of context and it, and it gives me an opportunity to discover music. So watching a reality show or a scripted show, and I watch many of both, and there's great music in it, I will go look for that music. Uh, and to go back to my Ingrid Wilson example, you know, I think she was the closing song for season three or four of Grey's Anatomy. I'm, I'm a Grey's Anatomy fan, watched a lot of it. And, you know, when that song came on, it not only fit the moment perfectly, but it, it just sort of further motivated me to go and, you know, listen to more Ingrid Michaelson because it just kind 
that moment right. So I think the combination of those different media and the way that music gets integrated into different aspects of our life uh, is incredibly important and, and certainly an avenue for, for new emerging artists to, uh, you know, to get their, to get their name out there, to get their talent out there. Sounds, sounds like great advice. And I appreciate both of you coming onto the show today to talk about the Grammys and the music industry and how it's changing the way that we connect to fans and uh, artists. So thanks guys, Brian, if somebody wants to connect with you, they want to follow your work. How can they do that? Uh, you can hit me on Twitter at B R I A N R E I C H or Google I am not the former high school basketball star. I'm the other Brian rich that tends to come up in <laughs> most of those results. And Evan, thank you again, sir, for being a guest on the show. And if somebody wants to follow you at the Grammys or connect with you in some way, what's the best way they can do that? Well, you can certainly follow us at, at the Grammys or um, I am at Hope and Change. Hope and Change. Have I ever asked you why Hope and Change? Because you guys really off, offline, both you and Brian probably have a lot in common. So I just want to say. Well, it was sort of a uh, it was sort of a, um, a, a tongue in cheek reference uh, and sort of a joke that's that that just ended up sticking after the uh, after the initial um, you know 2008 election and uh, it just kind of stuck with it stuck with me. Well, that's at uh, at hope and change or Bri hope and, uh, and, change. and uh, Brian is Brian Rich with an E. Thanks, guys. I appreciate your time today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Absolutely. That was our wrap for the show all about music, the Grammys. And that was uh, Brian Rich. And again, we're, we're going to have their information. Uh, but if you want it and you missed it here, you can actually follow me by going to at Tanya Hall Radio and use hashtag marketing mavericks or... You can go to our YouTube page by going to uh, Mavericks on YouTube, Marketing Mavericks, and you can email me by going to um, mavericks at twit.tv. And uh, of course, you can connect with us and ask your questions at any time. And if you get to the show and get on chat in advance, we'll try to ask your questions. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in, and we'll talk to you next week.